So this is another shredded uh, dollar store, well, Poundland to be precise, product that uh, won't be going back together again in a hurry because it was quite heavily glued together. However, it's a cheap, it's disposable, and I thought it'd be quite interesting. And it's a battery charger. And it's quite interesting in that it's got spring-loaded terminals. Each uh, port charges just a fixed current independently. And if you've got a AAA cell, you just push that back. It's spring-loaded. You just push it back lightly and it'll hold the smaller cell in place. But when you put a bigger cell in, like the AA, it goes a lot further back. And then once it's in, little red LED lights. Easy enough. So I thought, well, let's, uh, let's doodle it down what I think's inside it. And here's what I came up with. The 5 volt supply going through a diode to prevent it actually back feeding into the computer when it was turned off so you don't discharge the cell. Uh, two resistors to limit the current. One main resistor limiting the current to the cell. Um, and another resistor that trickles a little bit of current through the LED just to show when the cell's charging to light the LED. Technically speaking, the LED is not needed, but I kind of like it because it shows the cell is charging. So doing the maths, from the 5 volts, you'd be dropping uh, about 0.6 volts across the um, the, rec the polarity protection diode, the anti-feedback diode, and you'd be dropping roughly 1.5 volts across the cell because that's the full charge voltage of a nickel metal hydride cell. And it, generally speaking, it will start, if you had a completely flat cell, it would be zero uh, volts, and uh, then it would rapidly rise up to 1.2 volts and sit there for a modest time, and then at, as it reached the end of the charge, it would go up to 1.5 volts. So I was just playing on 1.5 volts here. So say that uh, 1.5 being dropped from the 5 volts, 0.6 being dropped from the 5 volts, round it to about 2 volts, and that gives 3 volts to drop across the current limiting circuitry. So if we wanted 100 milliamps to go through the main um, resistor and maybe about 5 milliamps through the LED, that would mean resistor values of, um, well that would be about 300 ohms, wouldn't it? Let's, uh, let's do the maths here. Um, R equals V over I, 3 divided by 0.1 equals 30 ohms, I'm sorry, that's 30 ohms it would be. Uh, 5 milliamps. Uh, now, this is different because say we're getting 2 volts across the LED, that only leaves 1 volt to drop across the resistor. Um, so this time it would be um, R equals V over I, 1 divided by 0 0.005 milliamps equals 200 ohms. And that was what I thought the circuitry would be. Because with this arrangement, when you put the battery in, it would ch get charged at just over 100 milliamps, um, and uh, the LED would light, simple enough. But this circuit does not do that. And this circuit just about melted my brain, because it was so odd. And it turns out it's got active current limiting in it. And there's not much in the way of componentry in it. It's got whoop, two resistors in parallel, so pretty much one resistor. It's got a transistor, and it's got the LED, and a, another resistor here. And all these are, it's all surface mount components in the back, but it's got uh, matching positions for the through uh, hole components. So the only components that are mounted in the top are, of course, the connector, the battery contacts, and the LEDs. And it, is, it just operates as you'd expect. You put the battery in, it lights up. Uh, now let me get the meter and show you the current here. So we'll get my trusty fluke. I've had this so long. I got this when I was, uh, oh, early 20s. But well, that was a long time ago. Oh, blimey. That was a long time ago. I've had this over 25 years. Okay. And it cost a fortune at the time. But the reason I bought the fluke meter was because it's very, very robust. It's got this real shock-absorbing case. And although it cost a fortune, it came from RS components, so it really did cost a fortune. Um, I, it had the high energy protection. I just thought it was a really good meter at the time. And I uh, just splashed out on it. John Fluke Manufacturing. It's made in the, it's made in the USA. I didn't realise that it was actually American made. But this one's got the high energy fuses, and this is before even they started introducing the uh, category ratings of meters. Great meter. It's been very good. So let's uh, turn that round to DC current, and we'll stick it in line with the battery and see what sort of current's going in. Oh, this is going to be a bit tricky, particularly given the spring-loaded doodads now, now sort of popped out. Uh, so I'll hold this on to...
here and put that there and the LED's lit and it's showing 110 milliamps. Okay, pretty similar to the circuit I uh, doodled out. But here's the thing, now you just short the cell out completely, the cell position, and the current is only 115 milliamps, so it's actively got um, current regulation in there. So I decided to reverse engineer the circuit, because, I mean, it's just a few resistors and a transistor. What could be hard about that? Well, for a start, it's a PNP transistor, and I don't know about you guys, but um, I tend to work with NPN transistors a lot. I very rarely use PNP transistors, and everything just goes upside down when you're using PNP, because everything's referenced to the 5-volt rail instead of the 0-volt rail. The only way I can, for the circuitry, the only way I can think they, they did it this way is because they wanted... Um, they wanted to keep the two negative connections on the battery holder at the same rail, which they are. So I'm not sure why they did it with that PNP, it seems odd. But anyway, this is the circuit, and I really, I thought, it's so odd, because it involves current regulation and everything, that to be honest, I to make it easier, I completely reversed it and made it an NPN version just to, to change it so it's easier to actually follow for, for someone who deals with NPN all the time like I do. So here's the NPN version. And the two resistors that are in parallel are different values. I thought they were just maybe a couple of resistors to increase the power rating. But one of them is 15 ohm and one of them is 47 ohm. And that comes out to about 11.5 ohms. And the difference is such that they've obviously chosen the 11.5 ohms as a very specific value for part of a um, current regulation circuit. So, the other thing that I couldn't suss initially was I thought that the current would flow through this 680 ohm resistor and through this LED and sure the LED would light all the time. And why is it that it only lights when you put the cell in? And how does the current regulation work? Because um, I've, I've come across the simplest single transistor current regulators before, but this is such a neat application. It's really well done here. What happens here is that when you feed current uh, down through an LED, then and there's a current uh, flowing through the, the base here, and what's the best way to describe this? As the current increases through these two resistors, the voltage across them will increase. And if you say this, this LED is exactly two volts, and the turn on uh, the, the voltage drop from the base down to the emitter of this, this, transi this transistor is about 0 0.6 volts. So if you deduct the 0 0.6 volts from the two volts, then you get 1.4 volts. Let's write that down here. And what actually happens is because as the voltage is um, going up across these resistors as the current uh, in increases, the, basically the emitter voltage that the base is referenced to actually rises up above the ground rail. And as soon as it goes up to about 1.4 volts in this case, the transistor will start turning off. It will sort of balance at that point. And if you then work it out... Um, so we're looking for about 1.4 volts um, to appear at this point before this transistor will start turning off. The 1.4 plus the 0.6 volt of the, um, the, the base to emitter. So if we do the maths and we go um, I equals V over R, so that's uh, 1.4 volts divided by 11.5 ohms equals it comes to about 120 milliamps. And that's roughly what it was limiting the current at. So that's how the, they're using the LED here as a voltage reference, a fixed voltage reference, to get that 1.4 volts, the 2 volts minus the 0.6 of the, the base. But why doesn't the LED light all the time then? And the answer is because if there's no current flowing through here, then the voltage actually has to rise up here to actually raise the voltage at that, uh, to actually raise the base voltage to the point that LED will light. So if there's no cell in place, the current is just going, it's going through this, it's going from 5 volts through this resistor, instead of going through the LED, it's just seeing basically a 0 0.6 volt junction there. So the voltage falls to around about 0 0.06 volts and the LED doesn't light. 
it that had that just about melted my brain trying to work all that out. So much happening. It's a simple enough circuit, and it certainly does have that uh, that feature that if you put in a bad cell, it was short circuited. Whereas on the doodle I did, um, if you stuck in a, a, a bad cell, so that the, a, that actually saw about say four point five volts across that, what would the peak current be? It wouldn't be dramatically higher, would it? Um, the current flowing through this resistor would have gone up to um, I equals V over R, 4.5. It would have been uh, divided by 30 ohms. The current would have gone up to 150 milliamps. But interestingly, through this one, because uh, it would probably be multiplied a, a lot more here, because suddenly it would be 4.5 volts, that would be 2.5 volts across that uh, lower value resistor. 2.5 divided by 200 ohms, and it's still it's only 12.5. You know, it wouldn't have been too bad. It would only be about 160 or 170 milliamps. So it would actually still have been within the USB rating, which may suddenly makes me think this would have been such a simpler circuit. And there's no transistors. Hmm. But um, yeah, uh, certainly when they um, start, if that cell shorted out. The dissipation, let's see, the dissipation, it'd be the 5 volts, pretty much you'd be dissipating the full 5 volts across these two resistors and the transistor. Um, the resistor would be acting as a variable resistor at that point, the transistor would be acting as a variable resistor, so that would be roughly about, say, 120 milliamps, uh, P equals IV, uh, 0 0.12, 120 milliamps times the 5 volts would have meant a power dissipation of 0.6 watts. I wonder how much would have been, most of that I suppose would have been dissipated in these resistors and if they're quarter watt resistors I suppose really that does come into their rating, that com comes within the rating. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, it was certainly very educational, really quite interesting indeed. So I'm adding a little bit onto this video because I, I wrongly said at the end, I guess most of the power would be dissipated across these resistors if the cell shorted out. So in reality, if you short the cell out, as I did earlier on, um, you suddenly end up with 5 volts across here. The regulator circuit still trying to work, so you're going to end up with 1.4 across there, which means you're going to end up with 3.6 across the um, 3.6 volts across the transistor. So that means uh, the short circuit count was about 120 milliamps. So the power dissipation of the transistor, if that happened, would be 3.6 volts times 0.12. And that comes out about 0.43, 0 0.43 watts. And the dissipation of the resistors under that same scenario would be 1.4 volts across them times 0.12 equals, say, 0 0.17 watts. So, well within the rating of those little resistors, but uh, I'm not convinced that these little transistors at the back, these little surface mount ones, are going to actually handle 0.4 of a watt. And if they do fail, if these transistors just go dead short circuit, as transistors usually do, then potentially the cell current, the charge current from the 5 volts uh, supply, is going to be limited only, let's say, if it was a dead short circuit, uh, if the cell was faulty, then it would be 5 volts would end up across those resistors. So that would be I equals 5 divided by 11.5 ohms means that suddenly 0.4 of an amp should go through that channel. Now, if the you damage the channel like that, if the transistor's gone short circuit, and then say we've got 1.5 volt of the cell there, then the current, the charge current, um, in those circumstances, it's going to be 1.5 plus what voltage? Uh, 1.4. Actually, no, 1.5. It would be the cell would be in, basically in series with 11.5 ohms. So that would be four, uh, 5 minus the 1.5 of the cell would be 3.5 volts divided by 11.5 ohms means the cell would be charging at 300 milliamps continuously. And also, there'd be nothing stopping it back feeding. Talking about back feeding, if you take the meter and you stick this cell in and it's not charging, you've uh, turned your computer off, then the voltage that this cell puts on 
the USB port, is this going to stay put? Try and make it stay put here. The voltage it's going to put in the USB port is going to be 1.36 volts. And the leakage current at that voltage will be 19 milliamps. So in other words, this thing will not fully at the full voltage, but it will certainly try um, it will try feeding back into the USB port and it will even, it will try if you put two cells in oh look that uh, connection, oh that's not very well soldered if you put two cells in this, I, I guess it would just try back feeding to the other cell as well and once again, this is where my circuit, the simpler circuit wins because there's nothing, uh, there's no transistor to go short circuit and also the, the only the there's a diode there preventing uh, current flowing back into the circuit and there'd be a diode in each uh, channel of the two channels so the, what is it, leakage current of these is going to be 5 nanoamps at best so you know near enough no discharge at all, certain, not even any leakage between the two cells so um, you know what, I don't know why they did the circuit this way, it seems slightly overcomplicated and they could have saved uh, and made a, actually more a better design just by going with the sort of resistors. Yeah, very odd, very strange indeed.